With so much going on during the divorce process, we should have someone to guide us. Welcome back to another episode of The Mental Health Break. Cindy Stibbard, a divorce coach, joins me to talk about how a coach can help you navigate the difficult divorce process, all while saving you time and money. Hi, I'm Dr. Nafisa Sikandri, a licensed clinical psychologist specializing in anxiety-based disorders. I created the Mental Health Break podcast to give you simple, actionable, step-by-step strategies to help you prioritize your mental health. Mental illness can cost you time and money. Ignoring your symptoms will only make the problems worse. Taking time out of your busy day to dedicate to improving your mental health can lead to long-term health and wellness. In this podcast, each week you'll learn tips, tricks, and proven strategies to help you regain control of your life, all while prioritizing your mental health. If you want to improve your life, regain control of your mental health, and feel empowered, you're in the right place. Let's get started. Today's episode is brought to you by the Transforming Anxiety Course, an online self-paced anxiety course to help you manage and control your anxiety from the comfort, privacy, and convenience of your own home. Learn how to transform your anxiety in just six short weeks. Course registration is now open. To learn more, visit transforminganxiety.com slash course. Today, I'm joined by Cindy Steibart, a divorce specialist who will help us navigate the choppy waters of the divorce process. Let me introduce her briefly before I bring her on. As a professional certified divorce career and empowerment coach and a certified divorce specialist, Cindy helps individuals navigate successfully through challenging times in their lives. After 26 years in the field of education and 12 years as a stay-at-home mom, it was Cindy's own divorce that propelled her to pursue a new career and direction in her life. Her personal experience of divorce inspired her and made her passionate about supporting others emotionally, mentally, and financially. Cindy became well-versed in how to help, support, and guide others away from making painful, expensive, and emotionally damaging mistakes that divorce can bring. So hi, Cindy. Thank you for joining me on this podcast and uh, talking about divorce today. Yes, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm so excited to talk to you because there's a lot of talk about divorce. I mean, a lot of people are getting divorced now because of COVID and uh, some people don't even know how to navigate the process. So I did just share a little bit of your background and expertise as a divorce specialist, but it was your own divorce that kind of helped you pivot in this direction, right? And specialize. So what about your experience made you specialize in divorce? I I think that divorce is such a socially stigmatized experience. And it's ironic that way, considering that 45% of all first marriages, um, and then 62 some odd percent and 70 into the 70s for third marriages, second and third marriages, um, that we don't handle this better as society. You know, we typically first run to get our, to get a lawyer, both sides lawyer lawyer up. All of a sudden we're going down this traditional adversarial path that is so antiquated. And that really puts a lot of emotional pressure and strife and financial devastation on the couple and the family as a whole. So when I first went through my divorce um, and left my husband, that was the path that we took. We initially first you know, lawyered up and then we weren't speaking to each other. And every letter and phone call and email to lawyers cost hundreds of dollars. And I had to liquidate some investment um, funds in order to, pay, to retain my lawyer and then pay for her. And I had blown through those funds in the first month and a half. And I was nowhere ahead of where I was, really where I started. And I panicked. I thought, how am I going to get through this? Being a stay-at-home mom for 11 years, having no real savings of my own, having now, because I wanted to leave my marriage, be cut off from the family finances. And I thought, how in the world am I supposed to do this? So I really had to reel myself in and do a lot of my own education and connecting with professionals to see who could best help me in the most affordable way. And what I learned along the way where there are so many people that can really support each little stage of the divorce process that can be done outside of just using your lawyer. You know, I was using my lawyer as a expensive therapist like many of us do. I was expecting her to be able to crunch all the numbers And really a lawyer is they're specialized in the law piece and they're so important to the process, but they're not the only piece of the process. So I really had to guide 
myself down a more of a coaching path. And as I was going down this path, a lot of people came out of the woodwork and they were asking me, you know, you're getting divorced. How are you doing it? What advice do you have? And people that I had no idea were going through the process as well. So it's such a, it's such a secret. It's something nobody talks about. So I felt inspired that I needed to be able to help people go through this process of divorce much more streamlined. You know, I wanted, I felt that because my experience was really making me well-versed to helping guide and support others away from making the big mistakes that I made at the beginning. And I feel that the biggest mistakes people make is that they just don't know what's out there. They don't know their options. They don't do enough research and know how to prepare. So my job as a divorce coach and a certified divorce specialist is to really help take, take them down that path, help to educate and empower and connect them to the right professionals so that they don't have to spend all of their finances and their financial future on their divorce. And they can start to really understand what the uncoupling process can look like in a more business-like way. And working with them on the emotional front too. A lot of mistakes made in divorce are usually very emotionally driven. So it's important to be able to give them that support system where they can handle and deal with their emotions so that they, they can move forward in their divorce process in the best and most rational and practical way that they can. You made some really good points about uh, using your lawyer for everything. And I have known people that have spent over a million dollars in the divorce process. And that's just insane. It, it's actually disgusting if you think about it, because, you know, the lawyer, there are so many great lawyers out there. I'm not going to say that there aren't because I've met so many along my along my journey. But there are also many that are doing this just for that you know, that, that paycheck. And so they're billable hours to clients and clients are so entrenched, entrenched in the process that they forget that every email, every phone call, every little back and forth costs them so much money. But as a coach, a coach, if I can get them kind of in that path of, all right, let's think about this before you go off and write a letter to your lawyer that you want A, B, and C, and D, do you? And is there something that you can maybe give up or what are your non-negotiables here? Because we know that we can't have everything we want in divorce. It's not a process of winning or losing. It's a process of getting to the point where we both feel comfortable enough to be able to move and separate the best that we can. And it's such an emotional time that people don't think about anybody else but that lawyer. Like, okay, well, my partner lawyered up, so I need to lawyer up. And we feel like that's, that's it. And uh, until you just mentioned that, I wouldn't have known to think about other people too. So I'm so glad that you're talking about this and and saying all that. And for people that are going through the divorce process to just know that there are other people that can support them. So what are some ways that you as a divorce coach are supporting people that are going through a divorce? So initially, I work with clients really at any stage of the process. I work with clients right from the beginning of their contemplating the idea of divorce and whether they want their marriage to work. So we can look at relationship techniques that they can start to put in their marriage now. And I can also help them get ready with what are the financial things they need to start thinking about if they were to then go down the path of their of divorce. What will their life look like if they choose that path? What would it look like if you stayed? So weigh the pros and cons. And then a lot of my clientele is basically that um, that client that have now they've decided that they are going to separate and they just don't know where to start. There are so many things that can be collected before get, even getting to a lawyer, such as all the documents and the financial documents that every lawyer is going to need in the process. So getting yourself a certified divorce financial analyst. Um, having a therapist, if it's something that you want to continue on for yourself, is a really good idea too. And then I also work on the parenting piece with, with a couple because the uncoupling part has so much impact on the kids and it can have a very detrimental effect on the children if it's not handled correctly. I don't believe at all that divorce traumatizes kids. I've been through a divorce family myself, came out the other end, and um, now I'm a divorce, a divorcee, I guess you should say, although I don't define myself as being divorced. Um, I feel that the way that we handle the process with the kids is really going to have some either positive or negative long-term impacts on them. So I help them create that environment that's most healthy for the children as the couple navigates this process. So it's really helping them 
boost them and give them confidence and that support system so that they can work with the legal side. They can have professionals on the financial side and then any other professionals that they might need. So I'm sort of there as their, almost their divorce concierge in a way, you know, setting them up with all of these professionals that they might need in the event that things in their divorce aren't going really well. Like another would, example would be finding a forensic accountant because they believe that all the finances are not being disclosed on one side. So we would go into that depth and figure out who would be the best professional to bring in in that situation. Or a parenting expert who really wants to work with the parents in terms of how they can create two cohesive homes. So there's a lot to think about in divorce and we're not expected to know it all ourselves, especially when we've never been down that path. But what, when we know better, then we do better. And so my job is to really make that clear for people and to know that there is so much support out there that we can change the experience of divorce. Yeah, you, you said uh, divorce concierge, but I just had this image of you holding their hand and guiding them to all the directions that they need to go to get the help that they need. And uh, it yeah. makes such a difference to just have somebody in your corner when you're in this emotional state, right? It, it really, really does. And I feel that everyone who goes through the, down this path feels alone. They don't know who to turn to. Family and friends are great, but oftentimes they're super biased depending on if they're on your side or your spouse's side. And sometimes we don't get the best advice from those people, especially when they aren't able to be objective. So it's super important to be able to have someone like a coach on your side who's going to say, hey, is there another way that we can look at this? Or have you thought of, of this? And then going right down into the divorce settlement and making sure, you know, have you dotted all your I's? Have you crossed all your T's? Are you sure that this is how you want this settlement to look? Because let's think about five years from now. You know, how do you want your, your kid's schedule to look like? Or how do you want um, how holidays and activities and whatever that is to look like later? Because these things are are binding once you put them into a final agreement. And sometimes just because you haven't thought of it, um, you don't you don't put it in there. So I like to say that I, I try to make the invisible visible for my clients so that they can think about all the different aspects. And I know that a lot of people aren't thinking about any of those things you just mentioned. They just want to finish it up and make it as amicable as possible. But I also have uh, a lot of patients First of all, they have a lot of shame through the divorce. And so they, they don't reach out because of that shame. They don't want to talk about it to too many people. But also, some of my patients are going through a divorce with a narcissistic partner, which the, just being with a narcissist in general can be a really difficult relationship. But mm -hmm. the personality type ends up making the divorce process hell on the on the person that's going through the divorce, but also on the kids. So do you work with partners of narcissists? And how do you help them navigate through that process? Because I know that there are, uh, the narcissist can be very charming and can uh, manipulate the lawyer or manipulate the judge. Is there a way that you can you help uh, people that are going through that kind of a relationship? Yes, I think that's that's very common. Whether someone's actually diagnosed with narcissism, you know, that's a whole nother thing. A diagnosis is actually quite rare, but we tend to put a lot of um, labeling on on narcissists when they are very difficult. Um, but doesn't say that it's not existing for those people because the narcissist is not going to likely know and that they have are having trouble and want to be diagnosed. So how I navigate this is I really focus on my client and my client's reactions only. Because the only way that we can move through this that's best for the client is to control our behavior on this side of the street. We cannot control that narcissist behavior. We cannot control anything on that side of the street. So how we respond to it, how we really think through um, our communications, because how their patterns as a couple have been have been um, built over the years when you're married to a narcissist can really be a default pattern that isn't working for them. So I like to bring in some different techniques and different ways of communicating where they don't have, they can set some boundaries and they don't have to bring in their emotions. So sometimes I even help ghostwrite emails and communications to my clients back and forth because it's far too triggering for them to be able to remove themselves from that emotional trauma of a narcissistic narcissist on the other side. So helping just sort of streamline that communication so that we can deflate it um, and it doesn't cause further enrage. And also by just 
trying to be as open and as accountable for our side as possible. I don't think that we can control the other side, but it is a very difficult process. So knowing the types of lawyers that that side might choose and making sure that, you know, if, you're, if your side is lawyering up hard, then maybe on this side, we aren't going down that collaborative route. You know, maybe mediation might not be an option if the other side is really the type to be digging in their heels and getting the best litigation attorney there is. So sometimes it does determine the direction of how things go, but it doesn't determine necessarily how we're going to respond and how the client can also save money by using a coach to navigate that difficulty in, in the long run. So it's a tough one. That narcissist is a tough, tough one, holy. It is. And one of the books that really shed light on this for me is that book, uh, I think it's by Dr. Carol McBride, um, Will I Ever Be Free of You? And it is all about going through the divorce process with a narcissist. But things that you don't even think about, the fact that they keep you in the court system over and over again, not for the sake of wanting anything, but just to torture you and make you suffer. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, the kids end up going through that process. And, and um, the, my patient that ended up spending over a million dollars was in a divorce with a narcissist. And he just kept dragging her through the court system just because he could and he had the money and he knew that that was going to hurt her. For, for those listening that are probably in a situation like that, really educating yourself, getting a coach like Cindy uh, obviously is definitely helpful because it is a very difficult process to get through. Get going to therapy is really important. So yeah, that, that just really concerns me. And I, and I think it's great that you are as a coach guiding and navigating the, the system for these partners of narcissists. Yeah, I, guess. Yeah. <laughs> I know it's, it's a very tricky one. And I think the communication does come down to it. And also doing a lot of reading, I find on how to co-parent, because really it's not about as much as about dealing with this narcissist right now, but you are tied to this person now for the rest of your life. And how are you going to co-parent those children in two different homes with this personality? And so as, as much as you think you're never going to get out of this process, this will be over, but your relationship with that person will still continue if there are children. So how do you get through that part? Well, it's gone to the point I've seen so many women struggle and suffer because of this divorce process. So many kids that are struggling uh, with the whole custody issues and the custody battle, not wanting to see the father or the mother, um, that now I'm like, when people are even starting dating, I'm like, really think about, do you want to be in a divorce battle with this person? Do you want to be stuck with them for the rest of this child's life? Because that's, you need to choose carefully who you have kids with, who you want to commit to, because this could, nobody want, nobody goes to the altar thinking that they're going to get divorced, right? We all think that we're going to get married. It's going to be forever. And it's going to be wonderful. And it's going to, we're going to get along. But the fact is, like you said, almost 50% of the population is going through a divorce or has gone through a divorce with their first marriage. So that's a high chance that it will lead into a divorce. So being really, really cautious about who they want to partner up with and who they want to have a child with, right? Oh, absolutely. And a lot of times, those personality traits don't come out until you have kids together or until you go through difficult times. So my advice is to never rush into a relationship. You know, don't just jump in because you're in love in the first year and move in and then start the process. Really take time to be two separate individuals. Um, the other thing I find interesting too is what, when you work with, on um, prenuptial agreements prior to marriage, if you were to ask those couples coming in to make those prenups, what are the chances that you think you're going to be divorced? 95% of them say, never, we're never going to be divorced, <laughs> which is so almost blinding in a way that we need to start thinking about, you know what, I know that you're so in love, but you could. So at that point, it's almost like maybe you're not ready for marriage if you haven't had that realistic conversation of, what if this doesn't work out? Because if it doesn't, what do we have in place for that time? Because of 45% of first marriages, I think it's 62% of second marriages, 73% of third marriages, if these are our statistics that we're working against, I'm not saying don't get married. I'm just saying go in with your eyes open and go in with a plan knowing that you know, there is a chance that this won't work. We're going to do all, all that we can. And of course, we want to be together. But if it doesn't, are we ready for that? 
It's kind of like a retirement savings. We know we put money away for the retirement. Do we want to retire when we're super young? No, but we also don't want to be poor when we retire either. So we have to get that sort of plan and practically thinking in place. When my ex-husband asked me, you know, we put a prenup together when I, we first got together and I was offended. And I think I was just so naive to think that, oh, it could never happen. When of course it could. It happened to my parents. It happened to his parents. Like, why couldn't it happen to us? So young couples really have that, uh, have that you know, conversation. And really that conversation, it brings you closer together. And if it doesn't, actually, that would be an interesting test. If it's a conversation that is too hard to have because it's going to cause stress and almost push you apart, then maybe this person isn't someone you want to marry because harder conversations are in the future. Right. And like you said, keeping uh, both feet on the ground and eyes wide open and, and knowing what you're getting into and having those hard discussions and conversations. When I was younger, I used to get offended about the idea of a prenuptial agreement. And now I think we all need to have it because it really does uh, help us navigate whatever's going to happen afterwards, whatever the breakup is, and it protects us and it protects the other partner and it makes the whole divorce process so much easier. But we think, no, it's, we're going to be in love forever and this isn't going to, this isn't going to break up. So Mm -hmm. uh, we do get offended, but it's not a personal thing. This is, but also another thing that I'm noticing is a lot of people spend so much time getting educated and trained for the jobs that they're doing, but nobody takes the time to learn how to be in a relationship. They don't learn communication skills. They don't learn what it means to sacrifice or or compromise. And when you don't have those skills, of course, a marriage is going to break up. So it's really important. I mean, for the people that you're helping um, post-divorce, what do you do? What do you do to avoid this from happening again and not be a statistic of 70, 80% of, of the chance of you getting divorced again? Right. I think it really does come down to, to being accountable for your role in a relationship. You know, marriages don't just break overnight. They erode over time. And mm-hmm. what's contributed to this erosion, and sometimes, especially if you're the one that's been left or you're the one that's been betrayed, it's hard to see that you're, you played any role in this. But to really look at yourself, and you don't want to play that victim. You don't want to be in that victim mentality loop of, I had nothing to do with this, and it's all of my ex's fault, and my life is ruined because of someone else. You know, take your power back. There's so much power in, in being accountable and making it different. So use, I mean, I use my divorce now as a catalyst for positive change. If I had not gone through it, I would not be looking at myself in a much deeper way. And I would not be changing my patterns so that I'm not bringing up old patterns into my new relationship. And even my, you know, my, my relationship with my kids is different because we start to look at everything and, and bringing a, your best self to the process and just continually to work on a better version of yourself. And I agree with you. I wish there should be, you know, r- relationship counseling before required before you get married. I, I've done a lot of um, training with the John Gottman Institute in Seattle and done a bunch of that bunch of those courses as well as with my kids. And it really comes down to communication styles and how you can really recover from difficult conversations and being allowing yourself to be vulnerable and be heard and not defensive and not stonewalling and, and, and using the silent treatment, you know, it, a lot of these come from the patterns of our childhood. How were we raised? What types of atti- attachment styles do we have? So there's so many layers as to why we behave the way we do in relationships. It, there's nothing but positive that can come from taking a closer look at how you interact and contribute to your relationship. And I do believe that there are some people that end up with a person like we talked about the, a narcissistic personality disorder, or maybe somebody that ha- that's an alcoholic or a substance abuser or something that's really difficult for them to have a healthy relationship with. But like you said, even if at that point, it really truly isn't their fault that the person was just not emotionally available. The fact is they fell for somebody like that. And so you have to look at yourself and the kind of people that you keep attracting, right? Why am I constantly attracting the emotionally unavailable person, the narcissistic personality, the substance addict, the alcoholic? Why do I keep attracting those kind of people? Uh, And then working on that so that you can change the patterns, because the more you understand uh, your patterns and what you tend to be drawn to, the the better off you'll be to change that and, and 
find healthier relationships. I agree. Absolutely. They always say that your relationships are a reflection of the areas in yourself you need to you need to grow or you need to work on. So what is it about that partner that is a reflection of you of yourself? So it's a, right. it's a deep, deep thinking, but it's definitely possible for everybody. Well, I just like if we want to avoid being another statistic, I mean, even if you had a divorce, how can you move forward and, and attract healthier relationships and and be in a long term, healthy, committed relationship? It, it requires doing the work yourself. It requires getting mentally and physically healthy yourself and then attracting the right people. Right. It definitely does. It all comes down to us. You know, we have to love ourselves first and really feel confident in who we are, know our values and be able to stand by those. And then we're able to share love and receive love from others much easier that way. Definitely. So in your work, do you work with uh, mental health professionals and mediators as well? Yes, a lot. So I really equip myself with a lot of referral partners so that I can reach out to them in need and when a client needs a referral. I am currently in Vancouver, excuse me, Canada, but I have clients all over the United States and Canada right now. So I have quite a network of, of referral partners around the country, both countries, so that I can really feel comfortable comfortable sending my, self, my clients to people that are in their area or not necessarily in their area, but can operate remotely. Because beautiful, the beauty of being remote is that I can actually connect them to the right people and not necessarily people that are just in their area. So it's nice to be able to have that option um, and working with some amazing family and marriage therapists and uh, counselors, mediators, and lawyers. There just is such a network of people out there who are really all putting their best interests of their clients first. And you can tell by the people that really want to support each other, you know, and be able to look at divorce as it's a team situation. You know, just like when you got married and, and hired a bunch of a wedding planner to help put all those things in place, right? It's just like that in divorce. You have to be able to have all of those people in place to to uncouple at the same time. Really good points. So you don't directly coach people, but you do refer them to mental health professionals, mediators, parenting coaches. Is that right? I mean, do, or do you directly work with them and coach them as well? Oh, I definitely coach them directly. But if they have something that um, their needs go beyond my capacity, and such as a mediator, you know, I'm not I'm not a lawyer, and nor am I a therapist that's able to go in, and work with with a narcissistic personality but I can help to navigate their emotions through the process of divorce and get them ready for their lawyer. So by the time they're in front of their lawyer and get down to that meeting, they're only spending that one hour session and they're really successful at keeping their finances in check and being prepared for what's what's to come. So I sit down with them before meetings and, and give them questions to ask their lawyer. And then afterwards to really follow up with, okay, now you have this information, what's the next steps? So it's really more of an action plan and then coaching the emotions that come up with it along the way. There are so many emotional hooks when it comes to, you know, assets and the family home and, and sharing of the kids that are really tough emotions. And sometimes even when people have therapists, you can't get in to see your therapist right away. Um, but the way I structure myself as a coach is if I, you're working with me for a specific term of time, then I'm at, I'm at your beck and call you know I'm at your disposal I'm, I am that sounding board don't call your lawyer just because you're upset about something that your that your ex said don't send that email or that text message <laughs> text me first let's work through that so we don't make some some pretty devastating mistakes in the process I mean I've helped a couple of patients uh before and after their their meetings with their lawyers and a lot of emotions do come up. I, I don't know too much about the whole divorce process, but just even being there for them and helping them deal with their emotions and dealing with what, what they're going through. I can understand that you, you're very busy when they hire you because they will need you a lot to just to talk about things and deal with the, the emotions that are coming up. Yeah, I, I really want to be that support for them because I feel like that's what I really needed at the time. So I know what that feels like and I know what they're going through. And if I had someone like that, that I could just reach out to, I think that I would have felt so much more stronger and empowered and com not comfortable, but confident maybe in the process and much less alone. So that's what yeah. I really want to help my clients feel. Because it is, it's a very lonely process when you're going through it. Do you also work with the whole family or just the adults? 
typically just the adults. I don't work with, with the children. Um, and I also work with adults who need to look at getting back into the workforce after divorce. So I ha I am also a career coach. And so quite a few times in my, in my career path that women um, specifically because they've been at home with the kids need to figure out how to go back and get a job because their support isn't going to last forever or on the flip side they've been divorced for a while and now their support is running out and they need to figure out how to support themselves so it's a terrifying adventure trying to get yourself back in the workforce if you've been out of it for you know a few years or even a decade I was out of the workforce for 11 years and thought, and I've got, had two kids, like, what was I going to do with myself? And that was terrifying in itself. Going back to any type of job, having to write a resume again and cover letters and go into an interview, that was very terrifying. And so what I do is help those clients really reach out, make, the, make connections, create that resume again, make a LinkedIn profile, connect them with people in opportunities that really interest them so that they can feel more empowered and guided in the process of getting them they're getting back in the game so to speak just even the thought of working but a lot of women that i work with even when they're when they become widows right um they've never learned how to balance a checkbook they've never dealt with the money uh, they've never saved any money for themselves uh they don't even know how they're going to get through like you said you you all the money that you had saved you blew through in a month uh, just teaching women to be proactive and have their own money and have their own checking account, their own savings account, uh, even if they're married right now, because we never know what's going to happen. And it's important to be able to learn those skills and, and implement them, right? Oh, definitely. I say that to a lot of my clients, actually just contemplating divorce. You know, Do you have your own credit card? That's one of the first things you need to go do. You need to start building credit on your own do you have your own bank accounts? And I'm not saying, you know, you need to hide this from your spouse or anything, but it's really important that you start that process. And so many of us who've been in long-term marriages who weren't the breadwinners and didn't have to worry about the finances, we didn't do that side of it because we were taken care of. But in the event that your marriage is to break down and you are going to have to go out and, and either buy yourself a new place to live or get a mortgage, you will need to have credit on your side. So even having that credit card that you use for your own personal um, use, it's really important that you start that now and getting a handle on what your finances are like in the home. You know, what is your mortgage cost now? What are the bills costing? What is the garden cost upkeep? What are the maintenance fees on, on your place if you live in it? Having a sense of what all these costs. So would you be able to determine how that would look for you as a single family um, after the fact, so really getting an, an an idea of what your finances look like. You know, you can always make sure to hire a really good financial advisor through the process. It's going to help you. But if you have your have an idea of this yourself, it will really help you in the process, and it will become much less of a of a fear factor when it comes to the money side. When we're talking about the narcissist, um, some of my my patients they don't have that ability because they are being controlled in so many ways. So they don't have access to their own account. They're, every penny that they spend is very carefully controlled. And they're not uh, privy to any financial transactions that happen that are involved with the home. Have you dealt with that and with any uh, of the clients that you're working with? And how do you help them navigate that? Um, that part is, is definitely difficult if they really have no information. There are ways that they can go and, and dig, like call or um, any companies that might their um, for their bills and figuring out what their mortgage would be, but investments and those types of things that they haven't been privy to, that's hard. And that's when a lawyer will need to come in because they will have to order the um, the disclosure of all those documents. But nothing is keeping a client from going out and opening his or her own bank account or his or her own credit cards just to start that process because that is really key to just have those in your own name in the event that something was to go wrong and you were cut off of finances, at least you were able to build your own credit um, and have a little bit of that to start. But the rest of it, when it comes to that financial disclosure, if you aren't getting anywhere with knowing any of those documents, that is when a lawyer will have to order that for you. And typically they place an order to the other side and they have 30 days to bring those documents to light. And then it becomes much more clear as to what you're working with on a financial level. 
It's all those little pieces that we're not thinking about until we're actually going through it, right? I just brought it up so in case somebody is in that situation, they can start thinking about how can I save some money, uh, even if I contact my family and let them know that uh, I might need to, they might need to save the money for me, or let them know what's going on so that in case something happens and you need them need their support. Um, I actually had a couple of patients like that that really had no no support and they were isolated to the point mm-hmm. that they couldn't reach out to anybody. And there was a lot of shame in, in those situations. So that's not going to really help you overcome the situation. Just go ahead and, and get the support, figure out how to save money mm-hmm. and hire a really good lawyer that knows what they're doing and a good coach, right? Yeah. And there are, you know, there are divorce lenders out there now that they that have really um, come to the surface in the last couple of years because of these situations when people are completely cut off finances. So they're divorce lenders and they basically give you a loan so that you can start the process because it's difficult to even retain a lawyer when you don't have any money to do that. And, you know, I had to liquidate some of my investments on my own so that I could, but had I not, then there are divorce lenders out there. Um, and I have, you know, those in my referral bank as well, that people who really do not have any money at all, but need to start the process. They lend it to you and then you do pay it back at the end after your settlement at a, at a, a low fee. So it's not, it's not too bad, but there are options out there. <laughs> Wow, this is so enlightening for me, because it's just things that you don't really think about, like I said, unless you're actually going through it. So knowing what you know now about everything and all the people that you've helped so far, what would you say to your younger self about marriage and even divorce? You know, looking back, I would have really done a better job with the prenup and my that stage because I really was so offended in my in my youth of 21 and not wanting to even look at the end when I feel like I hadn't even started my marriage. But that wasn't smart. I really needed to go in less emotional about it and more wise about what this could look like in my future. And I think in terms of marriage, we start when we're young, we, st- we start off really quickly with someone. And we don't often look at red flags the way that we should. We overlook behaviors. We let things slide really easily because we're so in love. And I think that, that those can often be really detrimental to the long term. If you're feeling like there are red flags in your relationship, there are red flags there for a reason. And just because you may not, and you're afraid that you're going to be alone for the rest of your life, I promise you, you likely will not. But really taking a good look at those feelings, is this the right person for you? How do you feel on a financial level? What do they want for you going forward? And what does a marriage look like? You know, if I was to look at a marriage and my definition of a successful marriage, I think so much of society places success of a marriage on based on longevity, you know, if you've stayed together forever. But a successful marriage is really one that served you well during the time that you were together. And perhaps things just grew apart. One party wanted to grow more than the other was. And really being open about what's happening in your relationship. I think another thing would be to work on your relationship early. Usually the couples who end up going to Couples counseling or therapy are five to six years too late. That is what most therapists say. So by the time you've already got there, normally it's really difficult to save. So even if you feel like there aren't any problems in your relationship early on, there's always something to work on. There's always something to discover about each other. And there's always a way to connect on a deeper level. And those ways of connecting will really help the long-term longevity of your relationship. And those are things I wish I would have done. I didn't have a spouse that was very supportive of doing those things. But definitely now as I move forward in my future, those are non negotiables for sure. (laughs) Great advice. Yeah, I mean, I think we all would do things differently looking back on the things that we've learned. And, uh, but you can apply all of that to your future relationships. (laughs) Absolutely. It's it's another chance, right? To do better. Right. Right. So where can people find you and connect with you and either hire you or continue this conversation with you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I have a website called Divorce Redefined. It's www.divorceredefined.ca. 
or you can in- email me at info at divorceredefined.com. I'm also on Instagram. My handle is at divorce redefined. Um, Cindy Stibbard coaching at gmail.com. Those ways, um, reach out to me anytime. I always have a free call for anyone who just wants to see whether or not that we would be able to work together and I would be able to help you. So there's no obligation on that first call. And I do offer a variety of different packages because everyone comes in this process at different at different stages and have different needs. So super customizable and super flexible based on everyone's needs. It's really about helping you through this really momentous time. I'm so glad somebody like you exists and that you're helping people navigate that process because it can be very an, an intimidating and scary process. And uh, it's great that you're helping these people navigate and and come out the other end stronger and better and more empowered. So thank you so much for having this conversation. I've learned so much about just uh, how to help my own patients going through this process um, and the resources available. So I would recommend anybody that's going through the divorce or uh, needing some help or even wanting to talk more to contact you and um, learn more about your practice and what you're, what you have to offer. Thank you. I really appreciate that. And I appreciate you helping to increase awareness of what divorce coaches can do. And and the more we talk about divorce, the less stigmatized it becomes. So I love that we've even had this conversation today. Thank you. Well, if we're doing 50%, close to 50%, one out of uh, two people is going to get divorced in the coming years. So um, it could be any of us. And so it's important to empower ourselves and learn as much as we can. So thank you so much for having this conversation. Thank you, too. With divorce impacting close to 50% of married couples, it's time to reduce the stigma and normalize getting support during this difficult time. During the interview, I talked about the difficulties of going through a divorce with a narcissistic partner. If you believe you're dealing with narcissism in your relationship, I highly recommend the book, Will I Ever Be Free of You? by Dr. Carol McBride. I'll have the link in the show notes. To get that link and learn more about Cindy, visit transforminganxiety.com slash 28. When you're there, go ahead and leave me a comment and let me know your thoughts about this episode. If you haven't already, you can show support for the Mental Health Break podcast by subscribing wherever you're tuning in from today. We have some great interviews lined up and you don't want to miss a single episode. Subscribe today to get notified when new episodes drop. I can't wait to see you here next week. Same time, same place. Bye for now.